All right, looks like we're live. Hello, everyone, and welcome to Hammering It Out. I'm Nath. Uh, some of you may know me from, as Anathema from the Foundry Virtual Tabletop server, um, Discord server. Uh, and I'm joined with my co-host, Cody Swendrowski. See, yeah. I didn't call you C.S. Wendrowski. Um, who, well, basically, we're, we're aiming to talk about general topics related to Foundry BTT, the community, and all of the awesome, awesome community contributors that we have out there, as well as some projects that we have going on. Cody, do you want to tell people what you do? Yeah, my name is Cody Jandrowski. I have recently joined the Foundry team as a software developer and apparently also as a media appearance. So that's just exciting. How are we doing out there in, uh, in general audio land? Audio is good. That's good. I like that. All right. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, I'm actually the uh, project coordinator for Factory Virtual Tabletop, which means I basically do everything that isn't code related that I can manage. Um, and I try and keep people on track, try and keep myself on track most days. Uh, and work with a bunch of community content creators to make sure that we have everything kind of squared away and ready to go when we're releasing content or when we're dealing with anything anything pressing that the community might need. I'm basically a Tropos go-to guy. Uh, we'll be joined a little bit later by Kakaroto. Uh, the illustrious, the one and only Kakaroto from Forge, uh, as well as a number of other projects related to community development. Uh, but for now, why don't we... <laughs> we, <laughs> we have an awesome comment in Twitch. Is Cody British? You do look, you, you do look very do British I? today, Cody. Is it the, is the, the gray vest, white shirt. I'm actually a native moose, so. Yes, uh, can confirm he's just hiding his antlers at the moment. <laughs> All right, so, Cody, we currently uh, just got out of a week of probably the busiest I've ever felt uh, with Foundry projects overall. Uh, how was working on 082 for your first, you know, couple of weeks? Uh, well, if that was the busiest we get, then I feel pretty good about the job overall. Um, only a couple extra hours overall, you know, but 082 was a good release. I, I, I think we got a lot done. I think there was a lot of interesting features coming. I feel like Foundry's really hit a part where like, you know, for a while it was, you know, build up parity with other VTTs and now we're going past, we're doing things that, you know, no one else I know does, you know, and some of the new sound features and such enable some really awesome stuff that's already been done in the community. Um, I've now been here three weeks working uh, with development and I gotta say each day has been different than the last. Some days it's, all right, here's a big publisher launch, you know, let's go deal with, you know, people talking about it. Uh, and what the community's, you know, rea how the community reaction is. Other days it's, all right, let's go, you know, dig through a bunch of bugs. Other days it's, all right, let's go write a new feature from scratch. And, you know, this today it's module dependent dependencies. The next day it's, you know, working on how, you know, tokens ha are handled, you know, with default data. Um, it's just a huge variety day after day after day. And I don't anticipate it getting boring anytime soon. <laughs> Yeah, that's um, that's one of the things that struck me when I first joined uh, as you know a contractor is the sheer variety of stuff you end up doing from day to day is uh, staggering is the word I'd use. Um, one day it could be something as simple as documentation. You're just writing an article. 
uh, and then the next day there can be just an abundance of new tasks, interfacing with content creators, interfacing with publishers, uh, helping to onboard new employees. There's just always something different that needs to be done. Uh, and the community is probably the best part of it for me. Interacting with the community, not only through live streams, but also through uh, just Discord on an almost daily basis, really, uh, it's probably one of the most, I'll say, sometimes troublesome tasks that I think I have to deal with, but it's just because it's such a volume. So being in the community discord, we have 31,000 members and keeping aware of as much, as much of the general content that's going on, the conversations, the new community developments, people working on new systems, keeping aware of all of that, it's very difficult sometimes. But the fact that we have such a relaxed, chill, and just generally positive community really makes a difference. Yeah, I, I got to say, it's always been nice to be like, you know, we were ready, you know, we, I put aside time for 082 to go, you know, to have a bunch of people needing help and such. And I went to bed at a normal time. People were completely fine with, you know, the issues that cropped up. They were helpful in logging, you know, what they were and helping to diagnose them. And no one was, you know, up in arms over, you know, an alpha release. In fact, having a few quirks here and there. For sure. I, uh, I'm actually really satisfied. We... We did indeed have a, a couple of bugs that were probably going to necessitate a hotfix uh, in 082 when we released, but ultimately 082 is in a really good place. Uh, I'm really satisfied with the testing process we went through. Uh, we've been, of course, stepping up testing efforts increasingly as we add staff, but we also uh, did something a little different this time around and included our community helpers and uh, and moderator staff in the testing process uh, and leveraged the awesome volunteer work that they did to help us just try and break OA2 as much as possible. And it, uh, I think it really helped track down some of the more critical issues and prevent them from hitting, you know, a live release. Yeah, I know one um, person who participated in testing reached out and was like, you know, it's really nice to see, you know, behind the scenes and see how much Foundry is, you know, investing weeks and hundreds of hours testing some of these releases and how many dozens or hundreds of issues get closed behind the scenes before something releases. Um, I know it, was, it felt like a frantic race of, you know, how fast can we fix bugs versus how fast can you guys log them? Uh, I, yeah, I think we put up a good fight. I'm consistently amazed at the rate at which uh, Atropos closes bugs. Um, I There have been issues that I've logged that have been ones that took us hours to come up with reproduction steps for and figure out how exactly to do it. And in two seconds, two minutes, he's turned out the fix and been like, okay, it's pushed. So as a developer, like diagnosing what's wrong is takes up most of the time, right? You know, figuring out how to reproduce the issue and where it's happening in the, you know, in the workflow of, you know, say Foundry is most of the time. And then once we know that we can, you know, reasonably go in and fix it. So the, all the effort that the testers and such do in writing, you know, anytime someone writes a really well-written bug log or things like that, both internally for stuff or externally for, you know, community modules, it always helps developers, you know, go a lot faster with their fix. For sure. So, speaking of, you know, OA2's launch and the overall development, uh, what's your opinion of the state of modules and, you know, uh, systems for OA2? Because I know the communities really, they really want to know if they launch OA3 beta or OA5 stable, 
uh, what's going to happen to their games. Yeah, I know we're getting increasingly high in numbers of systems who have swapped over, which is always exciting to see. And there's always like a tiered step, right? The library modules, systems, and modules you use have to be updated. And then the systems have to be updated so that the modules that depend on those systems can then be updated. So it's always this waterfall, fall, right? Um, but I think this update has been far less scary than you know was prophesized with the great document refactoring uh, that has ended up being a much easier change than i think any of us thought it would be um i i i think i'm done now done with my system refactor as well and it was certainly easier than i expected um even having done some weird things i was i was personally expecting because i'm those of you in the community who don't know, I'm what I uh, refer to as a garbage developer. Um, I I work with JavaScript in the way that uh, I first stumble into learning a new language in that I think I'll be very good at it eventually, but um, it requires a lot of effort and work uh, to actually think about things the way developers do. And I am not in that mindset most of the time, so it becomes difficult. Uh, but I was really surprised. I've got a private system that I use for my own games for internal testing and stuff like that. Uh, and in firing it up for myself, I was really surprised how easy it was to pick up and shift to the way the document system works in 08. Uh, most of my stuff just works and the stuff that doesn't it doesn't work because it's a very obvious change so i think it touched so many things but in doing so it made them all standardized right before some things followed pattern a and some things followed pattern b and now they all follow the same pattern it makes sense um, and as joining, you know, the team as a core development, I really appreciate the document refactor for internally, right? It makes my job easier. So I'm really glad I came after that change, not before it. <laughs> I, I've also heard a number of community developers like on the League of Foundry VTT devs talk about the the initial scare when they fire up their system in 082 and then after they start changing things and adapting within an hour they're like this is actually way better it's way easier to approach this because it's all standardized yeah i certainly uh honestly a little envious of people starting out new right the amount of resources available in terms of documentation and video walkthroughs and and templates and all that and the new ways of doing things that you know are just easier and cleaner and straightforward and make sense across the board like if now is a great time to start a system if if you are have not been looking into doing so um and i just really appreciate how much the community has grown and helped each other and it's always a super helpful community and we see people in development basics just sitting down like all right here's how javascript works here's how foundry starts loading data and such hours on end every day week after week uh, and that's just super awesome these people are volunteering their time to help others learn and grow and do cool things so the League of uh, Foundry VTT devs was kind of your brainchild initially, and now you've shifted to a more formal role with Foundry where you're actually employed with us. And how has that impacted relationships with the League? So the League structures itself in a mere fashion to how the main Foundry mothership does, uh, Discord does. And with that, we have, you know, moderators that we call ringmasters and we have helpers that we call fire jugglers. Um, and it's, we never, like, 
although I was server owner, I never like was the tyrant above other people. We always had, you know, people. In fact, Kakaroto is, you know, it was one of the ringmasters on the league as well. Um, they were people who equally were helping steer where the development community could, you know, help each other out and focus its efforts and things like that. Um, Calogo has now stepped up as like first among peers, and that has actually been really nice because. For a long time, like, you know, I was the person, you know, helping to be the olive branch between, you know, developers wanting certain things and Foundry wanting certain things and Foundry's also trying to work with the users. And now Calgo is in that spot. And, and I think, you know, he's seeing a bit more about like, well, yes, we're not making these decisions just because we feel like, you know, they being a problematic, right? These decisions are made with context and lot of thought and such and now he's like more exposed to that and it's nice to have like that extra ally of like yes this would be awesome but here's why it's going to take a while why it's not just as easy as doing it um, a recent example is you know optional dependencies are one that the development community has asked for for a while i internally was like cool i'm already working in dependencies maybe i'll take a stab at like an initial thing we talked about it and it's like well sure this works it can it, it does a use case fine but there's four more use cases we hadn't even thought of that users would run into and there was a case for people setting up incorrectly and causing more damage than it was worth so we had you know tabled that and put it to the future and like that's the kind of context that you only get when like you're thinking about well i'm balancing 32,000 users against one and a half thousand sorry 1.8 thousand developers now and also, you know, what we're aiming for for the future. It's it's hard. And the league's been doing a lot. We've we've been happy to lean on them a lot for the assistance that they can provide for other developers trying to work through the 082 migration, or rather the 08X migration, I suppose I should say. Um, they have something going on right now, don't they? Yes. Um, so one of the events that they've organized is called the Updatathon, I think is the official name. Uh, it's just, it's currently going on. It's just a, you know, hey, we're putting aside this weekend, uh, everyone, you know, who's you know, available, especially system developers and library developers, get together, stream updating the Foundry, talk, you know, we have organized places and such. I was in there this morning updating my system and such. Um, and it's, you know, it's just nice to hang out with other people do, solving the same problems and having available help. Um, so I, I'm, I'm hopeful that we'll see a lot more modules updated for 082 at the outset of this. It's really awesome to see so many developers actually pushing forward and starting to pick up the the new beneficial API changes in 08x and seeing the league kind of drive that effort is great. We never want to because because our community developers are all contributing their work voluntarily. We don't really want to shove them and be like standing behind them cracking that whip saying you know, are you ready for 083? Are you ready for 084? Are you going to be ready when this becomes stable? Because it stops being fun when you have people demanding that you update on a certain time frame. Mm -hmm. So seeing, seeing more of a, a casual, let's all work together and get our stuff going for the all these new cool features coming out. But inversely, on the other side, what you know, even before I joined Foundry, Foundry, what, you know, Nath, you personally reach out to developers and you know a ton of modules. And it's like, hey, developer, I know your module you touches this part of Foundry. Just so you know, we have upcoming changes. Let us know if we can help you. You know, it, there's certainly been a lot of outreach and knowledge distribution and things like that that has made this release a lot easier. And it, it doesn't feel, to me at least, like developers are being put to the wayside. It feels like they were involved in this from day one, and they, you know, there's as many resources as we could um, to, you know, make available. But I mean, with again thousands of them, it's always hard. I'm sure at least some, you know, haven't had the time to get caught up. And I hope that the updateathon is like at least. 
uh, yet another option for them to, you know, have a chance to catch up. Uh, now we should probably talk about some of the other things in 082 before we get to bring on our guest. Uh, yeah, so for those of you who didn't see the stream yesterday, uh, 082 brings overhead tiles out which is a fantastic feature. I'm looking forward to seeing the different occlusion modes that Atro's mad scientist brain comes up with. Um, presently, it just supports the tile fading out when something moves underneath it. Uh, but there is potential for it to include a radial cutout so that you have a circle around a token when it moves under a tile, but the rest of the tile is visible. And I think he has vaguely hinted uh, that he'd like to do a vision-based uh, cutout if he's able, which I have no idea how that kind of thing works, but it sounds really impressive, and it's he kind of wouldn't hint that it was possible if he didn't think it was. It's just going to be a question of whether or not the amount of effort needed to do it outweighs the time frame we'd like to do it in i think uh in addition you did some package stuff didn't you i did um as part of trying to make developers lives easier you can now it, say your package is you already update for 081 and it's still good for 082 or that even your package survives the 08 entirely and you know maybe it's a content pack or a map pack you can now update right in the admin page or on your remote manifest where you're storing your updates. Um, you can say, hey, this package is still compatible with 082 and it will propagate down to users right away. No need to do a new release. Um, and this among other features, I think will hopefully make packages easier for developers to maintain on the user side. If you're, you've probably seen prompts like, you know, hey, this module depends on this other module, please enable it. Um, in the past, we didn't really check if the if you already had those enabled, so it was you know often propped up when you didn't need to. Now we'll actually we actually check and be like we only prompt you to enable things that you can, and we only prompt you to disable things that aren't used other places. So you should see far less of those, and it should be much easier as packages share libraries to manage those as a user. But us developers aren't the only people who've been busy. Um, you and Cobalt have been very busy with uh, some organization. Uh, well, fortunately this time, I actually managed to kick most of the Icon Project work to my compatriot, uh, Roman, that is to say Cobalt, who uh, took on the onerous task of organizing from scratch uh, and categorizing and renaming 1,500 I'm sorry, can you say that again? 1,500? <laughs> yeah, 1,500 icons, uh, in, which are included in addition to the existing 4,000 icons we rolled out in 07 uh, for a total of 5,500 icons. It's a lot it's a lot of work. Um, when we initially took the project on, it was kind of, uh, oh, this is a good idea and it probably won't be a lot of work. It's just renaming files. How hard can it be? And turned into, I'm going to say months of actually trying to logically think about how, how best to organize them and deliver them in a way that feels natural for the community to be able to find them. Uh, they are, the project is now complete and we're aiding, we're aiming for uh, some additional icon work in the future, hoping, hoping that we can put our hands on a similar license uh, icon pack to add something for like sci-fi icons, which would be great. Um, and are any of these icons um, sci-fi or modern or western, or are they all more generic fantasy? 
this is this is 5500 icons mostly focused around fantasy there are a few things in there that could probably cross genre but uh generally speaking it's it's fantasy icons for now we uh we would like to branch that out in the future because i don't run fantasy games that often myself so while the assets are useful to me they aren't as useful as say a full pack of modern would be and just seeing around a modern like renaissance like you know people in the modern age using old weaponry you know <laughs> anyway so we're uh, we're now coming into our next segment which i think we're going to bring kakaroto in and get him all set up to join us uh, if you guys just hold up a moment i think he might be here with us oh he is muted i'm here uh, there we are and i'm not a hundred percent matt did you run a transition for us oh we are also being aided I probably should have said something, but we are being aided in production by a familiar face. Some of you may know, uh, you can't actually see him, mind you, but uh, Matt, formerly of Encounter Library and now an employee of Foundry Virtual Tabletop, uh, is running the show behind the scenes, pulling our strings and otherwise uh, being the man behind the curtain. So, uh, we are joined today by Kakaroto, uh, who is the founder and creator of the Forge hosting service uh, for Foundry Virtual Tabletop and a very well-known name in our community developers, probably one of the longest running community developers in the Foundry community devs overall. Uh, and we thought he'd make an excellent first guest just to talk about some of the projects that he has worked on and you know is currently working on yeah when did you um start with found like work uh, when did you find foundry i found foundry i believe it was may or june 2019. um that was quite a while ago um i was looking for a VTT that would not be extremely laggy, um, and uh, my my game, uh, my Curse of Strahd game, uh, had stopped because it was simply not running anymore. Because my group came to a cave with tons of walls, so nothing was working. So I had to find uh, an alternative, and I found Foundry. And uh, I think what sold me um, the killer feature really is that. Um, I saw a video of it, and I saw uh, that the players could click a button to open the door by, by themselves. <laughs> and I was like, why was this not doable elsewhere before? Um, and it, 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 to me, it was just a killer feature because it was just so logical. And I gave Foundry a try. Um, and uh, I remember the community back then was already uh, extremely helpful. Uh, someone got me into a voice chat and gave me a tour of the features uh, in their uh, own game uh, to let me know how Foundry is, how it runs, answer all my questions. And um, I love the community. The, I felt very welcomed. And uh, from there, I decided to, uh, to jump on board. Um, but yeah, for that though, I had to not lose all my work on the other um, VTT, which was World20. So I, I wrote World20 World Converter uh, to convert my game um, and bring that along with me, all my notes and, uh, and scenes and all of that. And then I continued from there. And then, you know, the modules, the ability to build modules, that was a um, immediate uh, falling in love with the with the idea, you know. So I started writing modules for it. Um, anything that I was like, oh, I would like it to do this. Well, I can make it do that. So started uh, working on modules. That's uh, that's amusingly close to how my experience went when I first joined the Foundry Discord server because I joined and it was uh, 
I, I had just come out of a different virtual tabletop where I'd spent six straight days trying to figure out how to design my custom game system for use in that and getting nowhere, spinning my tires and kind of having some negative interaction with community developers uh, on that Discord server. I won't name which one. Uh, and... I joined Foundry at 2 a.m. and this strange person named Jen Kitty answered all of my questions in the space of about four minutes and said, yes, of course you can create your own game system. It'll be a little bit of work though. Uh, and directed me to a channel to ask questions. And 10 minutes later, I had bought in, downloaded and was already beginning to scream at JavaScript. Uh, and that's never has, that that has not changed has not changed at all um, and this uh, this really weird guy named Moo Man took me under his wing and into a private message and proceeded to explain the universe in JavaScript to me while I was screaming for six straight weeks <laughs> uh, until my game system worked. You know, on a similar note, Jen Kitty was one of the very first people that like I interacted with with in the league. I'm uh, sorry, in, in the um, when I joined Foundry's Discord, um, I came for the animated battle maps. I stayed for the module, you know, uh, development and such. And what, my very first module was Discord Rich Presence, and she's just like, "Here's how you know. Here's some UX tweaks. You know, here's some feedback on what you build and such." I'm just like, "This is awesome. People are interested and helpful, and like going out of the way to provide feedback on the things I'm doing." Yeah, uh, it's staggering to me that that's still how the community works at 31,000 people because there were less than 3,000 when I joined I'd say based on numbers it was probably in the hundreds when you joined Eunice yeah uh, and Cody you joined slightly before me I think maybe after I couldn't tell you anyway it's the fact that we've grown so large, but that's still the feel on the community discord is really, you know, awesome to me. And I mean, Eunice, you, uh, you went out of your way to help me with some of my modules and JavaScript struggles at times. And it's just weird that it's, it's weird that we just can talk like people given how big the community has gotten you know yeah it's um i mean, I, I don't really remember helping you <laughs> honestly um, i was extremely um active in the community early on when it was manageable you know i remember when i was making that heartbreaking decision of okay i cannot read every single message on discord every morning um, but yeah, I used to read everything that was happening because I was, you know, involved. I love that community. Um, and yeah, I, I helped a ton of people um, with just getting used to Foundry, just like I was helped when I started. So I wanted to um, uh, impart that same experience that I got, um, which was Pronobis, um, by the way, if you know the name, he was active at some point. I, I haven't seen him in a while, but he was the one who uh, welcomed me into yep. uh, it's, it's really interesting you mentioned because some of the first Foundry Virtual Tabletop videos that I ever saw when I joined were from Philip uh, Pronobis, who I hope that guy's doing well. He was pretty active on the Foundry community when I first joined, but I think he got dragged into a bunch of real life projects and just hasn't been able to get back. I, I wish yeah. him well and hope he's still out there somewhere. Same. I, I think I asked him at some point or I saw him posting about it that, you know, he he had to get a real job uh, that was, you know, full time. And so he didn't have any more uh, free time to, uh, to spend with Foundry as much as he had before. Because I think when he started, he was um, still a student or he was transitioning from student to um, adult life, basically. 
don't know the right term for it. Um, but yeah, um, I, I have been, you know, my entire life basically has been centered around free and open source software. I started being active in the um, uh, open source community around 2001, I guess. Um, and it was, um, it was actually a friend of mine at university. Um, he was active in a project, um, uh, AMSN, if you've heard of it, uh, it was a um, Windows Live Messenger clone that was meant for Linux. Um, very popular at the time. And so I wanted him to add a feature. I was like, can you add this feature? And because uh, he was, he had joined the project. He was like, well, you know how to code. I know because we're partners in the same class learning how to code. So if you know how to do it, why should I do it for you? Just the code is available. Go there, do the feature and send it to us and I'll review it for you and merge it. I was like, really? Is that how I should do it? And he, yeah, sure. So I did and that worked. And the next feature, same thing. And then the next and then the next. And then eventually 10 years later, I was, you know, um, I've, I've been like for 10 years, the project manager of AMSN after that, you know, slowly um, I got involved in the community and in the same way, I have always been in open source and it's always that same kind of mentality of helping each other of uh, you want something then you can just do it. And even though Foundry is not open source, uh, it has that mentality that first got me into open source of, well, you want to change that feature. You don't need to send us an email asking us to do it. You should just go ahead and do it. And the modules are allowing that. So to me, that that's the closest we can get to open source with a commercial proprietary software. Um, and yeah, so, yeah. you'd probably be interested to hear that um, we're we actually have forward movement on working with a college to give um, university credits to people, students who do and participate to um, in a program working on found open source foundry modules, and they get some credits or buybacks with their um, comp sci program. I, I don't know the exact details. Um, but it's exciting that like, you know, Foundry, even, you know, a closed source software that has an open API can foster a huge open source community. Um, I think almost every module is open source at this point. And so it's always glad, good to hear, you know, people bringing that mentality forward and doing it. Um, so just like how you got involved in that last project, open source, you got heavily involved in Foundry. Um, you helped write the AV module for Foundry. Um, you and then at some point decide you want it to have hosted foundry and created the forge was the forge the first partner um hosting or i i'm not sure on that one um the first one to to be created but in terms of partnership with foundry um the foundryserver.com and the forge were both announced and released basically at the same time so um we are one of the first um, partners with Foundry uh, for hosting. And now the Forge is a registered LLC, correct? Uh, incorporation. In oh. Canada, there is no concept of LLC apparently, but yeah, for a corporation. But it's uh, kind of the yeah, same thing. Very happened recently, and that's always exciting to see the growth. Um, do you want to talk a bit about like what led you to start wanting to work on stuff like that, and how that's now become your full time job? Yeah. Um, yeah. Tell us. Tell us what madness led you to decide to become a, a server host. Madness is a good term for that. Um, well, the very first contribution that I did to Foundry, um, I think, apart from like in the module space, which I think was um, permission viewer module, um, was the addition of UPnP. So back then, um, anytime someone would start using Foundry, the first thing they, they did was come ask us in Discord, how can my players connect? And then everyone would start to teach them step by step how to open their routers port to do the port forwarding because it wasn't done automatically. And um, so I was like, okay, I don't like repeating myself. I don't like 
saying the same answer over and over again. So the solution is to find a way to fix it. Well, there's UPnP for that. So I I um I wrote a module for well not a module but like um uh, a yes module sort of um a proof of concept code for how to open the the router ports automatically using UPnP, which is universal plug and play uh, protocol that routers use to uh, communicate with applications and submitted that to um, uh, to Atropos who reviewed it and merged it and then that that made everyone's life much easier. Um, the problem was that for some people it wasn't working. Either the router wasn't compliant, it wasn't uh, working with UPnP, it's, um, sometimes it says that it's forwarding the ports but it's not, sometimes it's their uh, service provider that doesn't uh, function. Uh, whatever the case, there's always going to be some people that have a hard time getting boundaries set up. So if it works for you, then great. If it doesn't, then if you're not tech savvy, that can be a hard hill to climb before you get to that, you know, simple point and click experience. And I wanted to bring that sort of experience to, to people. I absolutely love the fact that Foundry is self-hosted. That has been a big selling point for me as well as a consumer. Um, but from a uh, usability standpoint, I have found that Roll20's uh, user experience of you sign up, you click play game, you have a URL that you send to your friends and they suddenly have access to your game and they can get back to it. The fact that it's always online 24 seven and all that, that user experience is something that is rather difficult to achieve in a self-hosted environment, especially if you don't have the skill set to take care of everything that's, that needs to happen around it. So I thought, well, I want to do that. I mean, I didn't think I'd build a business out of it, um, <laughs> but yeah, uh, I wanted to do that to, to help people in, in Discord who I was tired to trying to repeat myself and helping them verbally or, you know, by text. I just wanted to, here's a link, go there, it will work. Um, and so that's how I got started. And there was a second idea that I had already started working on for my personal game locally, was that I wanted to be able to access um, my development game and have my, uh, my, my real game that my players would connect to um, be two different Foundry instances on different ports, um, but that one would be automatically shut down when the other is being accessed because the license only allows you to have one instance at a time. I was already working on a system to proxy automatically and launch the right world based on the path, the URL and all of that. So um, I just merged the two ideas and thought, well, that would actually work a bit similar to the Roll20 experience where, you know, you, you you don't like you just play a game, you just open that game. You don't ask if that campaign is being, you know, is my DM currently playing in a different campaign so I know if I can access it or not. So, you know, I, I was trying to merge those ideas together and just build the forge around it. Um, and it turned out to be one of the biggest um, proof that I underestimate stuff in my life. <laughs> Like, the how hard can it be? I don't think I'm ever going to say that again in my life. <laughs> yeah, I... I Two notes on that. I, um, I'm i really amused that that's the origin story of the Forge. Um, there's There are frequent discussions amongst the community helpers on the Discord server about, you know, uh, how to automate, certainly recently automate the uh, the transition process between worlds in exactly the the project you just mentioned and someone commented recently i'm like 50 percent of the way to just starting a hosting service and we're like uh so hearing that that's how forge came to be is just hilarious to me um several people in chat being like man i was lazy you know and didn't want to do this so i just started the whole business that's a classic developer thing, isn't it? Like, I will spend four hours automating something that takes me two. Like, yeah. Um, corporate from um, the Reddit moderator team 
uh, suggested a book uh, for me to read, and in it, um, they use the expression "the accidental entrepreneur," and I <laughs> love that expression because it's it's really that, uh, and it's the concept of you have someone who is skilled in their technical work, and they they get tired of their boss or something, and then they thought, well, I'll just do it myself, and then they end up being an entrepreneur and not almost never doing the technical work anymore because they have to manage this business. And so, you know, <laughs> that's that balloons really quickly. Um, but I love that expression of accidental entrepreneur. Uh, as you've accidentally entrepreneured, you not only host uh, Foundry instances, you now have a functioning and possibly thriving marketplace with um, premium content creators selling content. Uh, how'd that happen then? <laughs> That was um, that was a very early idea as well. Um, it just takes a lot of time to to for them to come to fruition. Um, the very first idea of the bazaar, uh, which is what we call our um, uh, our repository of modules and systems and worlds uh, on the Forge, the bazaar's idea came before Foundry had that install module button that showed only the manifest. The, the the input for manifest URL. Back then, when you were looking for module, you were directed to the wiki. And when you wanted to release your module, you had to go edit the wiki and add yours to the list that started to grow and grow and become unruly. Um, and so I was, I was looking for a solution to that. I was thinking, I'm going to build a UI. Uh, I'm going to build something that you can browse and where people can uh, add using a uh, an interface that isn't edit the markdown of the wiki or send a push request with your uh, with your module description added by following this template, you know, because um, that's how we used to do it. Um, and then while I was working on it, um, Atropos was looking at the same problem and fixed it on uh, from his side, and so we had the. Um, ability to list modules and install them directly from uh, Foundry. And so I put mine on the side. I stopped there for a minute uh, while I concentrated on other stuff, but I always wanted to get back to it and do a, um, a fully blown uh, user interface that you can access with, uh, if you've seen it, you, you can have embedded video screenshots, um, you can have um, a lot of metadata that is uh, being posted there as well. And I wanted to have an area where you can comment, where people can uh, comment on the, the modules and give their opinions and their thumbs up and things like that. So I wanted to build something a little uh, bigger. So I got halfway there, let's say, so I have the interface, but I don't have the comment system or the rating system. And Foundry Hub was released around that same time, which is filling that niche. So I've left that commenting and endorsement system to Foundry Hub. Um, and then from there, the next step was the marketplace because there have been many people who were um, wanted to sell their content. Uh, very early in the Forge's development, before I implemented a, a system for, uh, for subscriptions, uh, it was based on Patreon. I mean, Foundry hadn't even been released yet, so the only way to get Foundry was by being a Patreon of Atropos. So I already had the system in place for uh, linking your account with Patreon, and so I just reused that same code, and uh, I, I believe it was Miska's Maps who contacted me and said, well, I have some modules that are available only on my Patreons. I'd like to have it on your bazaar. Is there a way to do it? And I just did a very quick hack where I enabled the ability for the force to see if they are a patrons of Miska's Maps and then uh, unlock the ability for them to install that content. And then I started getting a bit more requests from uh, other uh, creators for that. And then I, I worked on the, um, the, the marketplace itself, uh, which is a one-time purchase uh, uh, business model. Um, that's what I wanted for the, the marketplace. And now we have, uh, I don't know, 150, 170 premium content listed there. Um, we have quite a few every day that get posted, uh, new releases. 
Uh, we have all sorts of uh, creators from um, map packs. Obviously, we have some uh, software modules as well. And uh, we also have something that is uh, unique, uh, that is asset packs. So someone could just release an asset pack that isn't a module, it doesn't get installed locally, it just gives access to the user to um, the icons or the tokens, the map packs uh, without the wallings or whatever, just the images or the music uh, or anything like that, um, that is backed by the Forges CDN um, that makes it distributed um, globally and um, they just so it's not installed but it's enabled so you just enable the asset back and you have access to it automatically within your game um, so that's something uh, that is there and growing growing uh what we released uh in the last couple of weeks is an integration with dnd beyond which is something that i have been working on for a while as well um talking with dnd beyond it themselves trying to um, get uh, an approval with them to do this integration with the Forge. Um, I have verbal okay, allowing me to, to go further with this. And um, we have this, um, this system where from the bazaar, you can just uh, list the content, the source books that are available on DD Beyond and just with one click of a button, import the entire source book into your games. Um, and it that keeps is, growing. That is wild. So basically this this dnd beyond integration that you're using that you're developing i guess i should say uh, yeah. from the ground up for your approach forge is going to support importing direct from dnd beyond and you're working with dnd beyond on that yes basically that's wow i'm i'd be curious to see what mr primate feels about that oh he is aware uh, i have been in discussion with him about it he knows um but i'm he's been he's known for a while about it uh i approached him um i have um also told him that because his um uh, D &D beyond importer is basically doing the same thing that uh even though you know it's mit licensed i i asked for uh, basically permission to uh to look at uh, the special use cases, like, oh, this, the orc has a dot in the wrong place, which could break parsing or something like that. Um, so um, uh, he, he was, he's really chill. He's, he doesn't have any issue with that. And um, we collaborated a little bit uh, there where um, uh, it helped me save a little bit of time by, by looking uh, at what he's doing. Um, my implementation is very different though. Um, I thought it would be closer um, in implementation at the beginning, but it turned out to be uh, rather different. So I haven't used much of what he's done, but uh, it's helped me see a little bit at um, the kind of things that he used. And so when I was looking at what he did and comparing it with what I did, uh, I would file issues telling him, oh, uh, you're using a comma here, it should be a dot for uh, for the opposite or something like that. So I filed a couple of issues that he quickly fixed and we're talking in um, to collaborate on a project because one of the things that is important to me is that when you import a source book, you will want to have all the walls made. You will want to have um, the position of the tokens, you will want to have the lighting information so all the prep so it's not just about having the map and it's not just about having journals it's also about that prep that is not available in the and beyond it's not information that is there because they don't have a vtt right and so it's something that i want to work on and i want to do and i know that he wants to do the same thing so i i offered to basically um uh, well, he was already going to do something that is open source, uh, but I offered to work together, collaborate on a single open source module uh, that would be free and available to everybody with that information that people could, you know, if they don't use either of our uh, importers, they might just be able to take that module and import a scene and just replace the image with one of their own and would go play their scene without having to import anything from anybody uh, and with that data having it be free and freely available for everybody uh, 
then my reporter and his could use that data to merge it with the result of our conversions. And this way we ensure that everyone gets sort of a uh, standardized experience, you know? That is awesome to hear. I was unaware of the collaboration between you guys. That's fantastic. I'm, I am certain there are a lot of people out there right now who will be very happy with the news that there's increased efforts coming for further integration with D&D Beyond. I think that's an extension of the great community, you know, collaboration that we've seen. Like, you know, the bazaar itself, I know, like, was one of many ideas at the time of how do we list modules, how do we install modules, you know, in a different way and such. And people, you know, splintered off and merged together and I adapt and such. And, I, you know, some of the original code, you know, ended up turning into the bazaar and Ford the Foundry Hub um, package listing. Some of it got rewritten, some of it, you know, um, but it's glad to hear that even when there's commercial interests, because Mr. Primate runs a fairly successful Patreon for his work, and you obviously have you know benefits of that importing this content for the Forge, like you guys are still working together, which is awesome. Um, what was it like to work with D and D Beyond? I know that was a several months long process to even get started. Um, yeah, I mean, I already had contact with D and D Beyond because of Beyond Twenty, um, so. We already had that relationship between Kakaroto, the developer of Beyond 20 and DND Beyond, uh, independent of Foundry or the Forge. And so we were talking, I was talking with the project manager at DND Beyond, uh, we were talking about Beyond 20. And I don't remember, but something was said, and that sparked the idea of the converter. converter and I was thinking, wait, that can actually be done this way and that would make the best result. And I was kind of brainstorming in my mind during the call with the product manager. I told him, well, would you allow me to give that a try? And said, go ahead, give it a try and give us a proof of concept so we can see what um, what you can come up with. Um, and I said, well, yeah, okay, it's gonna be a few months away. Um, but then I couldn't sleep. So two days later, I sent him a proof of concept. Um, that they they liked um, seeing what I did, they enjoyed that, and then I got a call with uh, Adam Bradford, um, who uh, who already knew about Beyond Twenty as well, uh, but he saw my video proof of concept that I sent them, and he he loved the idea because it it just allows people to uh, integrate D and D Beyond with other platforms, and he really liked that, and uh, uh, I think everybody is kind of on the same wavelength of we don't like it when people have to buy the same content multiple times, uh, right? So, for yeah, being... that's a... uh, sure. Go ahead now. Sorry, I was just gonna say that's that's something that I've found really um, really interesting in the um, in the way it, it's kind of like an attitude all across the Foundry server, uh, where pretty much everyone is of the opinion that buying the content online once should be enough. Yeah. So the way Foundry enables people to, it, sorry, I should say enables publishers to sell their product directly and just have people activate it. Like that content is still available to you. Even if you were to stop using Foundry, you still have access to that information. So mm -hmm. it's being able to just buy it and have it is I think empowering and it's something that all of the community benefits from. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, there's there's always the the rationale that if you bought the book, that's the paper content and it's different from the digital version or the VTT ready version because that in itself requires a lot of work already. Um, so there is obviously you know if you buy um in my case it's curse of Strahd because that's what i was playing if i buy curse of Strahd, um uh the book then that doesn't entitle me to the vtt version of it but if i bought the vtt version of the of the of curse of Strahd on one platform then to me having it on a second platform 
is um it's still an effort but it's a smaller effort than the entire book which is because you're paying for both the book and the vtt work and so i would like to can i just pay for the vtt work itself for this new platform right um and so that's that's i think the beauty of being able to use dmd beyond is that you can verify that you have bought this uh, this content and now if you want you can convert it or you can buy the um the uh vtt edition of it without paying a second time for the the journals basically um the, yeah yeah and i've I've seen both sides of the equation. Like I'm, I'm a customer of Foundry myself. I'm still a patron of Foundry, uh, despite the fact I work for the company. And there's a surprising amount of work sometimes to do that game prep, to get your walls and lighting set up, to do everything cleanly in a way that is representative of the premium product you purchased. So if you buy a book, sure, you can copy and paste from the PDF into a journal, but it's not gonna look like the book. Yeah, The maps aren't gonna look just like the maps because you also have to add walls and lighting and you wanna make it really shine for your players. So I've seen how much work has to go into that to make it happen. But at the same time, I'm a customer, and if I already bought this content, do I want to buy it again? Mm -hmm. And is it worth is it worth it to me to drop the ten or twenty dollars that it might take to get that content in a virtual tabletop ready state, in addition to buying the book, or should I just buy the book and do it myself and take the time? How much? How much is the my my time worth to me yeah. and lately 10 or 20 bucks for for it is worth it um <laughs> i've stopped like i've stopped i i there's many wonderful map patreon creators but i've kind of gotten rid of any that don't provide foundry ready maps because i mean mapping isn't that hard but it takes time and if you if you mess up once and all of a sudden your players can't see through a window because it's actually a door um you know um sigil is a company that does um premium content creation and they recently launched um savage worlds and they just did a two hour long live stream not that long ago talking about the effort that goes into these content creations and how the entire new team of people you know converting this thinking about how it works best for foundry you know making the journals look stylized in a way that you can't get in other ways and such making sure the maps work per for foundry and such and that journal pins are there and such and that entity linking works like there's a lot of work that goes into that content and because like if you're a new pl player a new gm you can buy one of these modules and that's all you need you can run you know get all your text and content what's hard is because that's all you would need to buy they need to price it as if you don't already own the core book because otherwise why wouldn't you just buy that um it is a hard balance to strike it's definitely a hard balance to strike for me it's um when i started uh with roll 20 i i tried to do lost mine of pendlebar and i had already bought it and i was like well i have the source material right here and so i'm just going to prep and it was also a learning experience for me so that was great um but after the number of hours that i spent doing that, I realized just how exhaustive it can be. Uh, there's also a difference between this was done by a professional versus I did it myself, regardless of the amount of time it takes you. There's also a difference between this map is set up this way with this lighting and this wall, um, this walling versus should it should I put the wall at this position or that position? And then you start to think, like you have to make decisions. Whereas if you get it from someone else, they made the decision, so you don't have to wait. I, I don't know about you guys, but I have choice paralysis sometimes. So if I have to decide, should the wall be on the limit 
or in the middle of that thickness like that i can spend an hour thinking about it and i can redo I, it like three times you know <laughs> yeah i um i actually live streamed myself doing some premium walling for uh the awesome frag maps recently uh there's a youtube video circling around of me doing that um and i was amused because normally walling and lighting a map for me is like 10 minutes and it generally doesn't matter how detailed the map is or how large it is 10 20 tops uh but walling on stream for people actually watching me i i noticed a great and overwhelming level of choice paralysis just kind of struck me so there was this I don't know. It was like, it was like I had, even though it was only like six people in the stream, it was like I had to slow down a lot more and think about, okay, do I actually want this wall to be at the bottom of this or should it be at the top? When it, when I do it normally, it's just like, okay, bang, 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 done. It's Yes, I'm putting it here, no question. It's, uh, it's also like, in my case, I want to impress my players, right? And so I think it's kind of the same thing with you when you were in your stream. You wanted to do a good job for your um, your viewers so that they, they can see just how well you did it and there is no good choice, right? It's just like prepping for an actual game. There is no right answer. Anything can work, and it's just how you how you use it uh, with your players. And it, but it, it can be um, frustrating sometimes to just make that decision, just pull the trigger and just okay, mm -hmm. I'll, I'll I'll do it this way. And certainly if I have an adventure I already have access to and I'm writing notes and foundry for it, I am only copying in like a little bit of it and hoping I remember the rest. Whereas if I'm buying something, that same, you know, adventure you know, pre-prepared, they've actually pulled in all the text for me and I can click on people's names to, you know, be like, who was this NPC again and such? recent session i literally forgot who handed them the quest i'm like yeah that one npc well, i don't have notes on it i didn't take them <laughs> um, yeah that's uh the journals feature is probably my most used feature when i'm when i'm running my games i have i build entire networks of cross-linked npcs that have the like the entity links built in so when i click on them it just jumps to that that other sheet or what have you so that I can quickly reference and say, oh yeah, this guy has a serious attitude problem when it comes to certain rogues. So, you know, that kind of, that kind of approach really, it changes how the game works. Like VTTs are awesome, but when you, when your players first stumble onto a scene and realize that there are notes they can click on that tell them about the place they've been and when they were last there and what happened when they were last there, it really changes how, how they interact with the world you're, you're presenting them. So you built the fort first, and then you built the bazaar, and you built the marketplace with the bazaar. Um, you have the D&D Beyond integration, which is still under in progress, correct? Yes. Um, it has been released as a um, beta for my patrons, so it's still early beta, um, and we have a post in the forum that explains what you can expect. Uh, it's not ready for prime time, but it's uh, usable already. Do you have other ideas floating around, potential plans for other things in the future that you want to expand to? Um, yeah, there's there's a bunch. <laughs> um, we have a roadmap uh, on the forums that people can um, can follow and see where we want to take the forge um, long term. Um, I try to keep it short term, kind of. Um, but one of the ideas for the World Builder tier was an automatic backup system because uh, I mean the Forge is basically what I wanted 
for my own games, like the automatic switching of games based on the URL. That was something that I wanted. Uh, so it's part of my feature set. Uh, and another thing that I did was after every session, I would commit on um, a Git repository that was private, my, uh, my data folder, my world, so that I could look back at any time. So something that I've used in the past where my, my player would say, wait, how come I have zero gold pieces? I'm supposed to have, I don't know. I don't know when I, I, I messed that up. And so I would just go back in time. Okay, uh, 10 sessions ago, still zero. 15 sessions ago, oh, now it's whatever. And then I can go back to when that gold piece is dropped to zero and say, okay, this was the value that it was for. Or, you know, hey, since when you have this magical sword, you know, and um, go back or, um, you know, sometimes it's just about um, they went to a scene uh, that got massively modified by all the things they did in it. And I just want to recover the original unmodified scene because suddenly they're in a mirror world or something. So I can just use that. And um, that's one of the features um, that I wanted to build, uh, which I call Time Machine, basically, um, that it would automatically save a backup of your game anytime a session ends, uh, which we detect automatically based on your activity levels. And uh, be able to give you a, um, a view of uh, when the game was started and stopped and say, I want to uh, create a clone of the game on this date and then uh, go there. Because we have many quality of life improvements in the forest. So we have, you can just with one click do a clone world. Um, so it's something that we already have. So you should be able to do clone world but from this date instead. So that's one of the features. Um, I'm also in talks with Demiplane um, uh, to have an integration with their platform so we can have a uh, the matchmaking service um, that they've built. Um, so it's a sort of looking for group um, uh, service that has an absolute, uh, absolutely great level of integration uh, between just, you know, finding the players, but also making that session work for you. Uh, it has a ton of quality of life improvements as well, which is why I, I fell in love with it. Um, and so there's there's some talks there to, to, uh, to merge with uh, um, them playing from the uh, looking for group perspective there. Uh, and there's, I don't know, there's, there's many features I want to do. Uh, I do want to take some time also to just stop adding new stuff and just stabilize, uh, add some polish. You know, sometimes people will ask, uh, how can I do this? And you have to point them to the right button. I don't want them to have to come ask us where that button is. I want to improve a little bit the interface. The login screen is the first thing I wrote. It's absolutely horrible. It's completely different from the rest of the site. So we want to redo the login screen. So just small improvements like this, just polishing and stabilizing the platform um, in general before trying to do even bigger features. That's, I think, my my sort of short-term um, plans for the for Short-term, like the next year. Let's say the next year. <laughs> I, uh, I'm really astounded by the fact that you can actually carry through and implement projects that you work on. I uh, I have a tendency to instead do um, about 10% work on a project, decide it's too much work for me to take on, and then promptly shelve it forever. Um, the I think we're kind of starting to run on time here. So I, I want to make sure that we give the audience a chance to ask you some questions that, you know, you, you can answer. Uh, one that someone asked earlier was about the, um, you know, at, at which point they should switch to having additional licenses and setting up more, uh, more forged uh, servers. Uh, I, I say servers, hosted games. Um, 
and their question was what happens if several people from different games want to log on at the same time to work on their characters across multiple forge worlds so that's um going to be dependent on the number of licenses that you have so for uh, some people who have only one license um let's say the there's a world that is currently active but there is no player in it then it will be shut down and switched to the other world. If there is a, a logged in player, then you will receive an error that says a game is currently in session, come back later. But if you have more than one license, then you will be able to launch that second world. Uh, so we had when we launched the game manager um, option, um, we had one player, uh, one DM who had four uh, Foundry licenses and that was one great screenshot where you see the four worlds launch at the same time uh, within the same account using the four licenses, um, which was uh, uh, which was very satisfying to see. Um, and we have uh, I'll, I'll actually take this opportunity to talk about the user manager feature that we also have there um, that allows you to uh, basically automatically configure your users. So if you give them the, the invitation link uh, and they click it, their user gets automatically created within Foundry. And uh, you can also quickly switch game uh, user and uh, you don't have to enter your password anymore and things like that. Um, it's part of the same feature set with the game manager. Any more questions? Yeah, we have a question from Alaric. Uh, we should uh, about, he's a troll what's the question <laughs> uh about who your professional scapegoat is um i would say alaric is probably my professional scapegoat <laughs> i blame him for most things when they fail even though he has nothing to do with it <laughs> there you go Are said, you uh, I, I obviously already know but i wanted him to admit it <laughs> yeah we got a couple questions from CC Jamek. Um, what is the development work that you're most proud of? Is this first? Development work that I'm most proud of. Oh. There's so much stuff that I did. It's hard to pin it to one specific well, first one that comes to mind. Uh, I mean, the Forge obviously would be the thing that I'm most proud of. Uh, but I don't know if they're talking about what specific feature within the Forge that I would be the most proud of. Um, I think the UI that I've built for the Forge, both in the Bazaar and the Assets Library interface, not because it will completely revolutionize anything, but because my entire career, my entire life as a software developer, me and user interfaces have always been oil and water. If you have seen the user interfaces that I'm used to building, you would laugh and you would think that it's um, a drawing by a five-year-old that should be on a fridge somewhere, not in your PC screen. Um, and that has always been the case for me. I've never known how to write a good UI. Uh, and so... I feel that pain. <laughs> <laughs> I think most like developers who go um, uh, on the low level library uh, development, because I've mostly been doing like reverse engineering and low level networking libraries uh, in the past, um, they have trouble with um, user interfaces. But anyway, um, with the Forge, I learned to use Vue and I learned to use Bootstrap uh, as a framework for um, uh, like components, uh, CSS and all that. And even though I've tried to learn building UIs before, this is the first time that it's finally clicked that I could visualize, visualize it in my brain and be able to translate it to the screen. And so that would be the thing that I am most proud of, even though it's probably the easiest thing for uh, someone else to do. Hey, you gotta be proud of what you can do, what, what you do. They also ask, what are some other modules or systems that you're most excited about? Um, I'm gonna go with grape, grapefruit, grape juice. Oh, 
I always keep mixing that. Uh, grape juices isometric module. Even though I don't do isometric, I just am blown away by the amount of work that went into that module and just how good it is, how good it looks, and yeah. everything it does. Matt, hit the button. Yeah, let's uh, let's. We actually have a video that we're gonna show because we actually prepared for this. I was gonna talk about it later about grape juices isometrics. Just, uh, Matt, if we can get that video rolling. I, I, that was my first time seeing the orange juice turn to grape. Uh, I didn't like that. I would like to see that. Uh, otherwise, I liked the rest of the video. It's such an exciting module. I look forward to running out that again. intro. <laughs> We're not going to argue about that intro. Well, we will, but not on stream. <laughs> I, it entertains me. I'm sorry. I don't care. <laughs> um, um, Rob um, asks, what would be a d another dream project for you to work on, Forge related or otherwise? Not a dream project. Does vacation count as a dream project? I think so. <laughs> All right, that's my in, answer. In that, it's ne in that it's never going to happen for any of us? <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's a dream. <laughs> Life pro tip, you know, some place that has no internet, so you can't work. I would probably die from a heart attack if that happened. Okay. What? No internet? You want to send me to hell? <laughs> um, but no, no, I did do like a week or two weeks. No, yeah, two weeks, like 10 years ago somewhere um, with no internet. And it was absolutely amazing. After like the first hour, you realize that why was I so stressed? It's great. So yeah, I would definitely love to do that again. Nath may not like this, but I'm strongly pushing for a foundry cruise, right? You know, we can all hang on the same boat and roll dice together and be cut off from the internet. That so, sounds amazing. Can I join or do I have to get Atropos to hire me first? It sounds, that sounds awful. That sounds <laughs> terrible. No, no, just no. Foundry cruise 2025. All right, we'll we'll do it uh, the league style. Un Eunice can have my spot. <laughs> Late night with Nath. All right. Well, uh, Eunice, it's been great. I think we're gonna we're gonna switch gears and uh, move on to a few more community events and things that we've uh, we've got to talk about. I want to thank you for being our first guest and for coming out to join us to kind of chat about everything Forge related and all the projects that you've been uh, you've been working on, and generally to to thank you for being the awesome community developer that you've been. Uh, you're certainly a driving force in the uh, in the Fabric community, and I don't think anyone would dispute that. So it's it's fantastic to be able to sit down and have a genuine chat for about uh, you know. Wow, an hour. <laughs> it's been a great hour. Thanks so much for being on. Thank you very much for uh, having me, for um, inviting me, and for asking me uh, these easy questions. I was so stressed. We can get to the hard questions. Okay, I have to go. <laughs> um, and um, awesome scene hammering it out. It has been uh, a privilege to, to be your first guest and uh, I hope to uh, to be invited again when uh, when it's my time uh, once <laughs> more. <laughs> All right. Thank you. All right. So uh, as Eunice departs and uh, Matt removes him from the stream, uh, I think we'll uh, we'll go ahead and talk very briefly about some things that you know, have, have caught our eye. I want to just give a really rapid fire shout out to some of the awesome premium content uh, just overall that we've seen in the last month. 
to run through real quick, we had a uh, release for Das Schwarze Auge, which hopefully I did not murder the pronunciation on. Um, I, I, I actually reached out to one of our moderators who is Austrian for guidance on my pronunciation. So if I, uh, if I brutalized it, of course he did. Uh, but that's, that's fine. Um, we also had, uh, fantastic release from, yeah, uh, the boss is, is helping us moderate today. So he, uh, he just said, you can pretty safely call it the dark eye now that they support English too. I want, I wanted to try and be, you know, all, all elevated and at least attempt the pronunciation, but, uh, it is what it is. Um, but yes, they released a premium content module uh, for the core rules in English, for uh, the dark eye in English, which, you know, we have seeing publisher support drift to us is always a good thing. Um, and uh, you, Ulysses Spiele, uh, which hopefully I didn't butcher that pronunciation as well, uh, have been fantastic to work with. Uh, you can buy, of course, any of these premium content modules straight from uh, the publishers as I ramble down through this list. Uh, we had the honor of launching the first, I think first, community-produced premium content pack as... Uh, Adventures from Rugalt. Uh, <laughs> I, I'm Morrill, who is one of our fantastic community developers, has uh, informed me that the way I pronounced it sounded like sync. Um, so there's that. Um, but yes, Rugalt. Uh, launched Dragon Shorn Tales, which is an adventure package for both 5th edition and 3.5 for Foundry. Uh, and you can actually purchase that through DriveThruRPG. All of these are listed on our premium module page uh, on the Foundry VTT website. Uh, we also had the privilege of working with uh, the sigil team from uh, Peg Inc. Uh, Pinnacle Entertainment Group uh, for the release of Deadlands Weird West, uh, which is a whole premium content setting, including core rules uh, built on the backbone of Savage Worlds Adventure Edition. Uh, and that's available straight from Peg. Uh, we also got news of, uh, before I get to these, I'm going to talk very briefly. We also launched our first official Paizo premium content for Pathfinder 2nd Edition in the form of five individual bounty modules, uh, which are like little mini adventures you can go through. Uh, and they looked, all of this has looked fantastic. I've got to give a real shout out to the, uh, the crew who worked on Weird West, especially uh, Lord Zeal's work on the journal entries for uh, converting the book in just fantastic, top-notch, really beautiful job. Uh, oh, apparently he's corrected me. He also worked on the sheet. I, I'm going to be honest, I mostly just looked over the journal entries for kind of a final is anything broken, but I've been pumped to see people taking advantage of what Foundry Virtual Tabletop can do when it comes to things like CSS styling and, you know, implementing various character sheets, that kind of thing. Uh, the next two that I'm going to talk about, and we'll end off on that with a very quick video if Matt wants to queue up the Battle of the Birds thing. Um, number one, uh, two Kickstarters launched in the last month, one for uh, the Ruins of Simba Room, which I know I pronounced that right because I took the time to watch one of their videos. Um, 
which has already achieved uh, Foundry Virtual Tabletop stretch goals. Uh, so that will be coming in the future. Uh, and uh, one for Sirens Battle of the Birds, which is an entire, uh, I think, setting and adventure module from the people at Apotheosis Studios, uh, which we actually got to work up a uh, video preview of. Uh, Matt, if you want to cut to the video, let's let's show these folks what we did. I've been uh, I've been really impressed with the artwork for the Sirens project. They uh, they've got some absolutely fantastic stuff that they're working on, and the fact that it's coming to Foundry Virtual Tabletop is primo. But have you pre-ordered the I've... edition that has the custom mug? I have not. I'm still debating how much I want to contribute and what I want to buy in for because I'm not really a D&D &D player. So it's kind of a, do I want to buy it for the content and do the work myself or do I want to just get the module and then rule out, rule out all of the, uh, I'll say, D and D stuff as I as I work through it. I you know I I am not a D and D player myself either, but you know every GM could use a custom mug. And also think of all the maps that are pre walled, all of the you know artwork that's included, all the journals and NPC descriptions, the I, how many discs of music that they're including with it each for the area. Like e, I would think that that's. Personally, I'm still interested, even if I have, even if I don't even use the content of the actual story, just the raw add-on values is certainly interesting. Yeah, I. That's one of the things for Foundry, and one of the benefits is that I can buy this and use it in my own game without having to use it for Dungeons and Dragons necessarily. Uh, so that, that pretty much covers the premium content we released this month, but I want to take a moment and also just shout out some of the, uh, free content that we, we kind of just, we have so many community content developers and people who just want to bring their stuff to Foundry. We get requests from content creators every week to bring us 
all kinds of maps and music and tokens, art, all sorts of really cool stuff. Um, this month alone, we released, I'm going to say probably close to 40, maybe 50 maps from three content creators. We had a music sample pack from uh, a music creator with, I think, 15 music pieces in it. Um, and all of this stuff just comes as kind of a free sample of their work that you can just straight up use in Foundry. So we got 15 hand-drawn maps from Reclu Reclusive Cartographer. Moonlight Maps did an update bringing in a bunch of tavern maps and multi-floor multi stuff for already created taverns. Uh, and I got to personally work on a project with Frag Maps to bring uh, our first dedicated sci-fi cyberpunk uh, content pack to Foundry. Um, with 12 cyberpunk maps wall lit and ready to go uh so we're we're always on the lookout for more content creators who want to see a boost for their uh their art and and community while also bringing awesome free content to foundry uh Oh yeah, I forgot. Uh, Mi Mishka's maps actually includes also some uh, sci-fi content as a separate uh, compendium pack in Mishka's maps module. Uh, sorry about that, Mishka. It's always exciting to see some non-fantasy um, content come as well. Uh, you know, as though fantasy is my main, you know, genre I play in these days. I know Cobalt, you know, another Foundry staff plays uh, Cyberpunk Red, and I always love sci-fi things um, and look forward to be able to play more of it in the future. For sure, and and I, as you well know, I tend to gravitate towards modern games where I can. Although I'm starting to drift towards my own fantasy setting that I'm working on, but uh, news on that will come in the future, hopefully. Although all the um, Savage World stuff recently has been Western themed too, so it's so you know we're just getting lots of cool genres. Yeah, a hundred percent, and that's I think that's one of the things I like the most about Foundry Virtual Tabletop is it is not just D and D and doesn't want to just be D and D having a virtual tabletop that focuses on being system agnostic at a core level is really important to me. But at the same time, it doesn't lose, Foundry doesn't lose, um, like Tabletop Simulator, you know, is technically system agnostic, but, you know, it. I certainly wouldn't think say that's the best way to play, you know, 5e. Um, Foundry can both be agnostic while also providing here explicit things that make 5e better. And I like that as a product. Yeah, I, um, I'm, I don't know. I, I think the reason I enjoy Foundry so much for different games is because I can still move content between them. And I do this thing with my games where even though I have a modern setting, it's kind of a modern fantasy where there's a bunch of horror themes and there's it's theme parked almost where it would be very easy to have the players fall into a situation where they are in fact living out a fantasy role-playing game, but modern. Uh, so being able to shift stuff between systems, if you're careful, uh, is just a straight added advantage. For me, the biggest benefit is when my players don't show up to my session, I can play Zork by myself in Foundry. <laughs> yeah. uh, classic case of me saying something as a joke and developers. You doing shouldn't it. open your mouth around developers, Nath. Developers, they. Uh, I never stopped to think about whether or not they should do something. Just that we could. Um, we have a couple minutes left in the first episode of Hammering It Out. Let's talk about some of our wrap-up topics. Uh, yeah. 
recent modules that and other things that have been happening in the community. First of all, I mentioned before the League's update a is going on this weekend. It'll likely be other weekends as well, people getting together to update their modules. I'm real excited to get my table to zero eight as well with some of the sound updates and such. Um, exciting stuff. Um, a recent module update that I'm really excited about, GM Screen uh, by Caligo, uh, is a module that I was already using for my side of the table where it lets me have little, um, like, here's the monsters in this scene, here's some reference stuff. Um, but my players often forget some uh, parts of the system from time to time, and now it has a player screen as well where they could have little easy tags to the rules references or their current or their character sheet or things like that. Um, so make sure you check that out. Uh, I stream my games every Monday. Minimal UI is a recent module that launched. So it was, I believe, the author's first um, module. It lets you. It makes Foundry's UI a lot smaller and includes an option to completely disappear, which is what I use for the stream view, um, which is really nice. It, it means that the viewers of my stream just get just like the background, the canvas full of action. Um, finally, I'd like to talk a little bit about a module pack. Go ahead. Let's, uh, let's come back to that one because I want to talk about it as well. Matt, I, Matt, you correct your message right now. You know what you did. Yeah. <laughs> um, so since we're talking modules, there's a couple that I definitely want to talk about as well, which is, uh, I actually took the time to commission a module dev to kind of make a module to help me with streamlining some of the content creation process uh, when we're working with community content creators uh, to bring you all these awesome content packs and things like that. Sometimes we have to do things that the average, uh, I'll say DM or GM doesn't need to do, which is sitting down and walling 20 to 50 maps at once in a single sitting. Um, and sometimes you want that process streamlined a bit to kind of cut down on the, uh, I'll say repetitive nature of the task. So I actually contracted, commissioned a uh, work from a great community developer named Flamewave who produced Architect for me, which is a, a module specifically designed for that purpose. It brings a whole lot of quality of life, just quick adjustments for using the foundry core walling and lighting mechanics in a way to make it faster and easier to implement. So if you want to draw walls using a square tool or a uh, or used in conjunction with um, DF curvy walls, uh, a rounding tool, it also has ability to create light templates. So you can have a list of light sources ready to go and configured so you can rapidly just click stuff. Um, you can actually check out the uh, the architect module here. Um, the other one I wanted to talk about actually Kakaroto beat me to, which was the uh, the grape juice isometric module, which just looks fantastic. I've been a big supporter of that since the beginning, and I'm really looking forward to abusing my players with it when I can. Uh, the last, second to last one that I want to talk about is uh, Blitz, who some of you may know from Community Lighting and uh, before that Dancing Lights and the Soundboard module as well, uh, actually ran a uh, kind of alpha test thing where he's integrated kind of a voice assistant into Foundry Virtual Tabletop, which lets you do this really crazy stuff like move a token by telling it to move uh, group tokens by telling this voice assistant to group tokens together and it's called Rita R-I-T-A which I really encourage you guys to check out for how nuts it it looks it's definitely one of those 
developers just seeing what they can do modules. I, I, as always, love the development community and the crazy things they make. And Rita looks really usable, despite it being a you know an idea that it's like a voice assistant for a virtual tabletop. It looks really useful. Um, so I'm excited to give that a try as well. But I will note that it, it only works in Chrome. You cannot do it in Native Foundry, uh, the desktop app, um, or in uh, Firefox or other browsers. It's still super impressive mm -hmm. and speaking of super impressive so uh cody wanted to talk about this module i want to talk about this module we're going to have to fight to the death over it but basically it's enough features to talk for us to share yeah it there's this module called and i'm going to butcher this pronunciation because i can't speak french to save my life uh moulinet which uh is just it's a suite of tools that the developer managed to work together to integrate as a i don't even know how what would you call this cody it really feels like a bundle um but a lot of the focus is on data and on being able to share your data across different foundry instances in a way in a much easier format um a common issue that people you know if you are a new content creator and you want to share your map right now the right way the, the supported way was to build a module but that involves some level of understanding what is a module how do i make one how do i get it distributed how do i secure this things like that um one of Moulinet's main features is that you can submit the map straight from foundry and he will store review it make sure there's no copyright and then store the data so that other people can import it in um, I think this is only focused on free data. Is that correct? Yeah. So we actually, when this when this module was first being discussed on the server, um, on the Foundry Discord server, I should say, um, it was kind of really up in the air because it's it's one of those things that it could potentially have copyright implications and it could have licensing issues and we were really concerned about you know we didn't want to approve this module and have this developer get slapped with lawsuits or anything like that and you know we we always want to protect the community developers whenever they're releasing anything and you know knowledge of licensing is vague at best uh for the average person and i'm no lawyer cody you're not a lawyer we don't have a lawyer on staff with Foundry that we just, you know, throw something to and say, hey, is this okay or not? Um, so we try and just do our best and err on the side of caution whenever something gets submitted to us. And this, this awesome community dev submitted it after we had put a kind of copyright block. Um, and we worked with them in kind of this really excellent collaborative way where they they came to us after it was you know denied approval and said what would it take what would i have to do to make this acceptable and safe and ensure that you know it, it should be fine for the community to use and and what would you want to see from me to allow me to do copyright approvals on maps submitted through this for distribution to the community. And we had to have some pretty big internal discussions about how best to approach it because we never want to stifle any module developers creativity or prevent them from doing something that's just really cool and beneficial for the community. But at the same time, we also don't want to let our community devs end up in legal situations because, you know, Foundry said it was okay. Uh, so we ended up sitting down with uh, with the creator of the Moulinet module and just working out a way to make it acceptable. And they made a lot of changes on their side 
and it was a great resolution overall. I, I'm really happy to be able to, to say that the uh, the tools came to the community. So, Cody, why don't you tell us about some of the things this thing can do? So the scenes module, of which I think he did end up splitting them out to different modules, correct? Um, yes. One big one. The scenes module is the one that we especially were, you know, had to talk about. It lets some uh, a creator share their scenes straight from Foundry without having to make a module. Um, icons let them let you search and import icons from gameicons.net. That's another run where we want to make sure that the source of those icons. Um, were in fact something you could use gameicons.net is one that we have i think a license for or it's cop or it's available for use um on a similar note image search you can search bing images and it will and it, you can then import those images straight to your game um we this is another one where we end up going to like you know looking at what others were doing uh, other vtts and being like well if they have similar features you know that are also like powered by bing you know that puts the onus on being and not us right um tiles you can search for tiles and drop them on your map sounds you can search for um you can let moulinet manage your sounds i think this one is going to be less useful in 08 with our new updates but certainly useful in 07 um and finally and as if all those weren't enough soundboard lets you prepare sounds and control them um in foundry in a more kind of more like Sirenscape style um but really just all sorts of things that about letting you have access to more external data and manage them locally in your foundry and build up in your world in a faster way yeah i've um i'm really pleased with this as an example for what i feel just and this is my personal opinion is the right way to do a multi-feature module as let me let me treat it like a salad bar let me pick and choose chunks that i can install and use and if i don't want to have certain features let me not install them you know it's and the the bing image search is probably going to be i i hate that it uses bing but Bing's license in terms of use supports it. Um, it's probably going to end up getting worked into my Foundry install because I, I'm i just really impressed with the ability to really quickly do what I'm already doing, which is pull images in and put them in journals to show my players. You know, another one I want to quickly bring up now that we're talking about it, um, another one that they submitted it and it's like, this is an awesome module, but please, we need to be on the side of copyright safety. Someone made a text crawler in the style of Star Wars and they, it was, you know, called Star Wars text crawler, which totally makes sense as a name. Um, but they had also included like episodes one, text crawl in their image and it's like dude this is an awesome module i used to do star wars campaign this thing would have been awesome back when we did it can you please remove the episode one like uh text and you know what let's be safe can you call it something like space text crawler um and he was happy to turn it around and such and a quick matter of and get that out unfortunately i don't have a campaign right now i can use the module in though I'm gonna have to figure out how I can throw my fantasy characters in sci-fi. Yeah, hundred percent, hundred percent. I'm, uh, I've, I've got a lot of love for the Foundry module development community. They're just such creative people using such different tools to work together and produce content for everyone to use. It's. Uh, I don't know, heartwarming for me. So I think we have reached the conclusion of the first episode of Hammering It Out. Did you cover everything you wanted to cover? Did I cover everything I wanted to cover? Yeah, I, I think we're good. So I want to thank everyone for coming out. This is going to become a, uh, a monthly oh. stream. 
We, we forgot probably the most exciting piece of it, which is that uh, JDW, the creator of uh, Dice So Nice, oh. has launched a premium store for custom 3D models of dice. Uh, it's called Rollsmith. It is alive now. Um, dice range from 3 to $5 for these gorgeous wooden and marble right now as their initial launch set dice. Um, they are custom models, which means you can't, unfortunately, use Dice So Nice's options to oh, like change their text um you know late uh color and things like that it's part of the model um but it's very exciting i look forward to um them launching additional dice in the future yeah i i totally forgot about the uh the rollsmith thing uh when we were going through the uh, the list of awesome content and premium stuff that's that's available out there right now um Matt Uh oh, Nath uh, froze up here. dollars for a seven wooden dice sets yeah i'm jdw and and the artist i think i, I was looking at the the site what was her name jdw is working with an artist to create these and some of these are just fantastic all of them are really navy navy is her name yeah just i'm i'm not even playing dice related games right now i'm playing a, a different game system that uses something else and uh i i think i'm gonna have to contact jdw and be like listen we need to do something to bring playing card support card and make so it nice look like this Yeah, it's uh, I'm pumped for the Rollsmith launch. I think a lot of people are going to be really happy with being able to buy custom stuff uh, for just making their dice look different and better. But uh, we are now five minutes over time. Yes, this is going to be uh, a monthly project. We're going to be working on uh, one of these in the first week of every month going forward with the intent to really, uh, you know, talk about community topics, engage with the overall uh, Twitch community, as well as the people from our Discord. And if you're not on our Discord, please drop in. Uh, I'm sure we can get a link in chat for it. Um, we're hoping to showcase uh, next time some some more awesome community features and if the timing works out right possibly even talk about 08 stable which we're hoping to launch within the next 30 days 100 license giveaway no jegasus there will not be a 100 license giveaway <laughs> we might be able to see about getting some license giveaways worked in though maybe Anyway, uh, thank you everyone for coming and uh, look forward to seeing you all next month. It's been a pleasure, everyone. <laughs>